now turn to the Word of God, and I invite you to follow along as I read. Our scripture passage today is Psalm 99 in its entirety. Hear now God's Word. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king is in, in his might loves justice. You have established equ- equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord, and he answered them. In a pillar of the cloud, he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. Our Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord, our God, and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord, our God, is holy. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Oh my goodness. Good morning. Good morning again. Wow. Not the start I was looking for, but that's okay. We are continuing our sermon series today, as you just heard uh, Laura read, that is called Summer in the Psalms, where we are taking one psalm and going through it in its entirety each and every week. And today, as you heard, we are doing Psalm 99. And Psalm 99 comes at the end of a particular string of psalms that have the same theme from 93 to 99. They are referred to as kingship or royal psalms. They are psalms with one collective goal, which is to proclaim and to celebrate the Lord our God as the king, the king over all creation. And so since Psalm 99 comes at the end, it's sort of the culmination of that message. And so it is a big psalm with a big message for us today. So let's, um, let's kind of sit forward and let's be attentive and let's, let's dial in and give God the honor that he is due. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father God, we praise your name. We know that you are mighty, but you are also good to us. I pray, God, that uh, you would send your spirit. I pray, spirit, that you would fill this place, that you would fill and enliven the hearts of your people, that you would give us ears to hear, and that you would change hearts of those who may not know you, Lord, today. And we pray that, uh, I pray that my words would be your words, God, and that um, I would get out of the way and that anything you want to say would, would shine forth this morning to bring Definitely not me, but bring you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the psalmist, as I said, he proclaims and he celebrates the Lord. And he does so hard, right? Nine verses, but he seriously gets after it. He's like a combination of like an MC at an award show or maybe like a hype guy at a rally or something like that. And he does it by going back and forth. If you, if you look at the text, he first starts by addressing the, the readers or the hearers, because this would have been sung, the hearers of the psalm. Okay, and he tells them who God is and how wonderful he is. But then he's so caught up in doing that that he turns directly toward God. And he changes, and instead of talking about God, he talks to God. He uses the pronoun you. And he tells God how great he is, and he reminds himself of how great God is, and then that drives him back to speaking to the people again. And it kind of goes on like this, back and forth throughout the psalm. And this really is a model for us of the Christian life, that what we are supposed to do is we are supposed to proclaim and speak forth into the world who our God is, his excellencies, so that people would know him but we should be so amazed by it ourselves that we turn toward him, that we gather together and we worship him and we we tell him how great he is and then that brings us back to going out into the world and doing it again. And so that is the model that the psalmist takes and it's, it's the model that we should all take in our lives. As he does it, 
he uses, there's one particular thing that he focuses on, one we might say attribute of God, which hopefully you've picked up on by this point in the service today. It is God's holiness. Very good. That was better than the first service, but don't tell them I said that. Yeah, I love congregational participation in the service. Yes, the holiness of God. If you look at it, he, he actually closes out each section of the psalm. He repeats this re- refrain in verses 3 and 5, holy is he, talking about the Lord. And then verse 9, it kind of gets to this fever pitch at the end of the psalm in this emphasized and ecstatic sort of rewording of it where he says, the Lord our God is holy. And all of that together, together gives us the first point for today. Holy is the Lord. And so if you're taking notes, you should write that down. Holy is the Lord. That is what he chooses to focus on, which in our time and place is usually not where we start when we engage people about God, isn't it? I mean, we love to talk about God's goodness. We love to talk about God's kindness and his love. And all of those are wonderful things, and they are certainly true of our Lord. But it is also true, but uncommon to speak of in our day, the holiness of God. And I think there are two reasons for this in in our culture and even inside the church itself. The first is we don't really understand what it means. We know it means something special about God, but, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly what we are saying when we say that God is holy. And then, secondly, when we understand what it means, we are a little leery about the implications that that has for our lives and upon our, our lives throughout, throughout our days as we, as we walk with him. And what I mean by we don't really understand it is it's this term that kind of expresses that God is very different from us. And so it's hard to understand. But that's actually the point, that Holiness we use often to refer to God's moral perfection. It does mean that, but it means far more than that. It means that God is other. The word for holiness that appears here is called kadosh in the Hebrew. Can you say that with me? Kadosh. Yeah. It has a, an onomatopoeia quality. Everybody remember that from like high school literature course? It, it means that the word sound matches its meaning. It's it's weighty, it drops, kadosh, and that's because it's this heavy thing that is different from us. The word actually, holy, means separate. It means separate or set apart. Holy, with a W, different, no pun intended, from who we are, from the rest of his creation. God is separate and set apart, not just in terms of distance or magnitude, but also in terms of even the category of things that he fills that no one else does. As you heard in the song we sang today where, it, where it's holy, 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 that's the only word in the Bible that appears three times in succession like that. And it does it twice. Once in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah is, he has this vision of the Lord in his temple And he hears the godly creatures, the seraphim, singing, holy, holy, holy. And then in Revelation 4, 8, surrounding the heavenly throne and all of God's angelic choir and all the people are singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Three times because three in the Bible is a mark of completeness. It's sort of the end of the story. It says everything that we can say about God. But the first place it appears in Scripture is in Exodus chapter 3, in verse 5, when God comes to Moses in the burning bush, and he reveals who he is, his character to Moses, and he says that you are on holy ground, as he tells him what his name is, his personal name, which is the Hebrew word Yahweh, it's a version of the word to be, and in our Bible, we translate it as Lord, but with capital letters. Did you notice that in your You see that in the Old Testament, and you see it in the bulletin today in the Scripture passage. That's not a a typo or something. It, It is to set his name apart, to make it separate from the regular everyday term for Lord, because our God is holy. And by now we should see the weightiness of it, that the Lord is holy, says his name, the Lord. He's holy because 
He is. He is, he exists, and everything about him is in a way that nothing else is. It's a summary statement of all that God is. He's holy because he's God and because we're not. God is holy because he's independent of his creation, and we, of course, are completely dependent on him. He's holy because he's infinite, and we are finite. God is holy because he is eternal and timeless, and we are not like that. There is this um, image. Uh, Let me make sure I have this right here. I got off on my place again. This is two services in a row. Okay, I'm not there yet. Good. All right. So the challenge, I think, in our lives is that holiness is something that we think can kind of be set aside if we don't understand it, but it can't be shrugged off and it can't be left alone. And that's what I meant by that we have trouble with its implications, that the entire Bible is aimed at telling one specific story. From the fall into sin in Genesis 3 all the way to the end in Revelation 22 in the new heaven and the new earth, it is a consistent story of, that answers one particular question. If God is holy and we are not, how can we possibly get together with him? How can we possibly enter back into the presence of a holy God? And the psalmist spins this out through three separate points, under, like subpoints under this. And the first one is that the Lord powerfully reigns. Look at verse 1. The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. God reigns in power, and it should shake everything when he does, even our very hearts. That he reigns with strength, and he reigns in that position without apology is what he is telling us the psalmist is saying right here. And he's depicting that by talking about this special space from which God reigns on this earth. And it would have looked something like this. This is an artist's rendering of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, so the Ark of the Covenant was the container, the gold-gilded container that held the law tablets given to Moses at Mount Sinai. It also was held by those poles and was carried before the armies of Israel as they entered into the promised land. And it was inside the Holy of Holies, the the holiest place inside the tabernacle where only the high priest could go only one day per year. And in that, he would give a sacrifice for sin and would cover it and everything in the room in blood, a picture that the cost of sin is death. It is this holy thing that on the top has these statues of of these creatures called cherubim. Now, they're described throughout the Bible. They have wings and kind of feet like a lion and a tail, unlike anything we've seen put together here on earth, but they are majestic and holy, and they're meant to reflect that of who God is. And in this, the psalmist is saying, I want you to think about the most holy place that it's possible to imagine in this life, because that's what this would have meant to his original hearers, that it's the most holy item, the ark, and it's guarded by these holy creatures, the cherubim, and it sits in the most holy room, the holiest of holies, as I said, in the holiest place, which is inside the tabernacle built at the Lord's instructions, which is inside the holiest structure, which was either the courts or the building of the temple once it came to be, in the holiest city, Zion, and in the holiest place in the world, the promised land of God. And he says that's just barely holy enough for God to rest his feet on it. Did you catch that? He calls it a footstool or a throne that God would sit on it. That's a picture of how holy our God is. And that is the reigning of our God, which should cause us to tremble. But I don't know about you, but when I look around in the world, I don't see a lot of people trembling at God's holiness. Not a whole lot. And this, this I mean both inside and outside the family of God. So outside the family of God, I think it's because, of course, people do not know the reality of the holiness of God. And so they either ignore it or they push it aside or they mock it which we have seen in the uh, very recent times, in the last handful of days, actually, right? 
because they don't know what they're doing. But it actually, even though it happens sometimes in those large ways, it happens in the air we breathe of our culture all the time in a much more clandestine and more difficult way where before you know it, you are saying things and are doing things that are taking God from his holy place where he is to be honored. But the Lord says to those who do not turn to him and to those who mock him that he will have the last word. He says this, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Very clear. God will not be mocked and he's the one that will handle, handle that. This is from Romans, the Apostle Paul quoting from Deuteronomy. But I want to start somewhere else. I want to start in the house of God. Because the reality is that if we're honest, we're still supposed to tremble. Did you know that inside the church? But we don't do it very much, do we? We should joyfully tremble. I mean, we know God. We know who he is. But we should still be struck and trembling. Maybe in the way that, you know, how do you joyfully tremble? Well, on your wedding day, do you joyfully tremble? I did. Yeah, you do. When you first hold your newborn for the first time, you joyfully tremble. Maybe when you have uh, that first day of a new job, which is like a big career thing for you, you're excited and you're kind of anxious and nervous at the same time. That's, That's a type of joyful trembling. I think about my first job outside of college. I, I was a I was part of this financial analyst development program at one of the largest banks in the country. And uh, since then, through some mergers and acquisitions, it's become the largest bank in the world with hundreds of thousands of employees. But for those of us who were part of this program, we had the rare opportunity to have just a few minutes with the CEO, where there would be like six or eight of us that would sit down with him, this, this person who was this like venerable leader of Wall Street, the one who everyone else answered to, the one who most people at the company never even got to meet, and we got some time with him twice. And how do you think I prepared for and approached those meetings? Hmm? Did I kind of just wander in late? I did not do that. No, I thought, boy, I'm going to make sure that I avoid anything that I think might make me sick ahead of time so that I don't miss it, right? I'm going to think through what I'm going to say. And the questions that I'm going to ask, I'm going to dwell on that. I'm going to, I'm going to set aside the clothes that I'm going to wear so that I don't have to think about that on the day of, but I'm, I'm ready and I'm there for those two really special meetings. How do we approach Sunday morning? Because, you know, the thing is, Sunday morning we get to come and meet with somebody who is a lot more venerated than that CEO, and that is putting it mildly. I mean, if you think about it, the only lasting impact on my life out of those two meetings was this, was being able to borrow this sermon illustration from it. I mean, I don't remember anything about them, and I'm sure that the CEO doesn't remember me or meeting with me. It would be super weird if he did, right? And yet, every single week, we are invited to come into the presence of a God who is so much more above and elevated, so truly sovereign and in control, so all-knowing and magnificent, and yet he he invites us and he commands us to come into his presence. And not only that, He remembers it because it says in the Bible that he knows the very hairs on our head. That's true for all of us. That should be a joy to us, amen? We, we We should think about things and prepare ourselves for entering into his presence, but but we don't always do that. I mean, I know when I come on Sunday mornings, I, you know, this is my job, right? To be here on Sunday mornings, and yet today, Um, At the last minute, I grabbed a second shirt because I thought I may have worn the shirt last week. That had nothing to do with God or planning for meeting with him. It had to do with myself, right? And it was at the last minute, no preparation. I showed up a little bit later than I would have wanted to. And all the different things going on in my head as opposed to meeting with the one who is holy, who powerfully reigns. And he does. And he also properly rules. Verse 4, the king in his might loves justice. 
You, he turns and addresses the Lord now, have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Now, justice here means making proper judgments, that God's, God's judgments are always right and true. They are perfect. They are proper. And at the same time, righteousness means proper standing and behavior before the Lord. And the word equity, which you've seen there, which is an alarm bell word in our world today, does not mean the 21st century alarm bell that you think it means. That when we hear equity today, depending upon how it hits your ears, we tend to either think of, wow, that's wonderful, let's ring the alarm bells of freedom, right? Or we think something like, wow, equity, huh, I've heard that word before, let's ring the alarm bells of Marxism, you know? But the reality is that's not at all what this means. What this means is that God is orderly and fair. That God is not haphazard. He, is, he does not fly by the seat of his pants. He does things completely orderly and fairly for all people. He's not interested in uh, oppressors and oppressed. He's not interested in partiality of one group over another. He's interested in all groups coming under his reign. Amen? That is what he does, and that is who he is. The Lord in his might, his might doesn't just make right, his might actually is right. And that is a really, really good thing. It's good news to us that we serve a God like that, because that means that our God is different than every other leader, every, all the other tyrannical forces in this world that we see, where when you get more power, it usually results in less justice and less righteousness, but we don't serve a God like that. And that's great, because we want a God who is orderly and fair. We want a God who is just. And at the same time, if we really knew what that was, we would know that that's also bad news. It's also bad news, and this is why it's bad news. Because if God judges rightly, what the Bible says is that all of us, if we are judged rightly on our own as we stand before him by our own merit, we cannot stand and survive that judgment. This is how Paul describes it in Romans 3. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And then in verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We desperately want a judge who is actually perfect, who judges rightly and properly. And at the same time, we recognize if we look into our own hearts for just a minute, that we wouldn't survive that judgment because God is holy and on our own, we are apart from him and we can never meet that standard so what do we do? Well, we need, we need something more than this. We also need a Lord who perfectly redeems. Let's read verses 6 through 8 again. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord, and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud, he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Moses, Aaron, and Samuel, they are mentioned here because they were stalwarts of the faith. They were a gift from God to the people to lead them, to intercede for them, to, to bring them back to an understanding of who God is, to reconnect a sinful people to a holy God. And the problem is, even in the ways that they tried to do that and they were effective, the reality is there was always a distance that was left over. Aaron was the only one who could sacrifice to God, not the people. Moses was the only one who could climb the mountain to be with God. The people couldn't even touch the mountain. Samuel was the only one who received the word of the Lord and spoke it to the people. The people didn't receive it themselves. And all of them were left separated, it says in the, in the text, by this pillar of cloud, that God was there, but he wasn't quite with them. And this is why, as God himself says to Moses in Exodus thirty three twenty, but he, the Lord, said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Sinful humanity cannot enter on its own into the presence of a holy 
God. And this is true in the text if you look closely in verse 8, that even those, it says, who obeyed had wrongdoings. In, in the same breath, in verse 8, he, he says that God forgave them, but then that God avenged their wrongdoings, truly forgiven, and yet the wrongdoings were punished. Now, how is that possible? How can you both be truly forgiven and God, who is holy, not just turn a blind eye to sin and pretend like it doesn't happen? Because we want a God who's fair and just. Well, this is the heart and the center of the Christian message. It is the message of the gospel that answers this question, and it runs throughout the pages of Scripture. It's hinted at in the psalm, but even the psalmist didn't know in that sense what it was that he was writing that God recognized that he is holy and we are not. That the Bible has this thing that it calls sin, which in its simplest form just means that you missed the mark. It was an archery term. And see, God said, because he's holy, he sets down a holy standard for his people. And in big ways and small ways, often without even thinking about it, we have, as Augustine said, turned inward on ourselves We have really moved the target, is how bad we missed the mark, and put ourselves at the center instead of God at the center. And there's no way that we can get it back on our own. We can try to do good things, we can work really hard, but the reality is we always come up short and miss the mark. We always tend to try to put ourselves back into the position of God, or we take the things of God and put them in that spot. But left in that place, God did not leave us in that place. Amen? He sent his son. And his son came as the one who was holy, the anointed one, the holy one of Israel, the true Israel, as he's called in Scripture, which means he was the people for the people. He was the one who didn't just make the sacrifice, he was the one who was the sacrifice. He was the one who went to the cross for the sins of everyone else. And the way that this works is it is by faith. It is by grace, and that just means an unmerited favor. There's nothing that we can do to earn it because we never could. And that means that there's nothing we could do to lose it because it depends upon the Lord. We just come to him and we say, Lord, I understand that, that you are who you claim to be, that you are holy and I'm not. And because you're holy and I'm not, God, there's nothing that I can do, but Jesus has done it. And I believe that his sacrifice was successful, that it did what it needed to do, and he proved that by rising from the dead because death could not hold him. The penalty for sin was lost on him, but he took ours upon himself. Now, maybe you have done that a long time ago in your life. Maybe you've heard that thousands of times, but you've never actually thought about it in those terms or anywhere in between. The reality is once you come to faith in Christ, as I said, there are implications to the holiness of God. And it changes everything about what we do, how we organize ourselves, how we structure our lives. This is why each section of the psalm, it's like this reminder, closes with what we're to do. Praise his great and awesome name in verse 3. Worship at his footstool in verse 5. Worship at his holy mountain in verse 9 that we're all supposed to exalt the Lord. This is what the people of God are created, or I should say recreated, to do. And I just want to close with a few application points of what that could look like. And I want you to think about in your own life, as I go through these, how you would, how you would carry this out in, um, in your day-to-day lives and in, in what you do. So here's the, the first one. Look up. You know, if we are curved in on ourselves, we need to look out away from ourselves, and we need to look up to the God who is holy. We need to ponder the reality that he is other than us, and yet he has come near in Jesus. When you come here on Sunday morning, you might think that we kind of just put a room together because churches look like this, but it's actually very intentional with the way that it's designed. When you walk in, it comes straight through all the way. You can see through the glass all the way up to what? The cross. You walk into the room, it has high ceilings. Why? Because we should be be drawn up to a God who is above all things. 
because he's the one that we're supposed to be looking at, and we should be drawn forward to where he did his greatest work and the culmination of all history until the day that he returns, because it's about him. This week, my, uh, uh, my daughter and a handful of high school students from our church went to this camp that uh, is called, it's put on by RYM, it's a ministry, Reformed Youth Ministries, that our church partners with. And they had a really good time at this camp, as I understand it, right, Abby? Good time? Yeah. And uh, we didn't rehearse this, so she's real happy about this right now. But in any way, um, one of the things that she, that she shared with me that she said was, was stated multiple times at the camp was, was this statement, and I want to get it right. You matter, but you're not the point. Okay? You matter, but you're not the point. And maybe my favorite part about it was she said, you know, like, you guys say stuff like that to me all the time. Yeah, amen. (laughs) That's right. Why? Because I don't just want my kids to to kind of pull themselves up with some sort of false self-esteem. We are not the center. He is. And so we look up to him, and then we see that a God who is holy actually calls us into his presence and into eternal life with him, boy, do we matter a lot more than we would if we made ourselves the point. So we look up to God. And part of that is showing up, showing up in the presence of God. Yes, that means coming to church, and there is no way to deliver that message other than preach it to the people who already came, right? But that's what, that's what we are to do. We gather together as the people of God in the presence of God. Now, we also can do this, of course, uh, when we sit down and we read his word, when we fill our mind with the things of God, when we get together with other Christians for accountability, for Bible study, fellowship, whatever it might be. But at its base, we come into the presence of God because he is the one who's holy and he commands us to worship him. And when we do, we worship him. We lift him up. We sing, Right? Amen? Amen? We sing. Part of the reason that the, the singers and the worship leaders are over here and not here is because they're not the center. This isn't a performance, right? It is worship leading. We lead the congregation in worship and we all sing. That is part of the ways we joyfully tremble before our God. And when we do that, we speak up. We do it inside church and outside of church. There's a double meaning here right? We, we pray. We confess our sin to our God. We sing. We have readings and extol His excellencies of who He is. But then we also, just like the psalm, we turn outward into the world and we look for our opportunities with those God has placed around us to speak the truths of God, to engage them on a spiritual level on the reality of who God is, that they may take a step toward Him and understand His holiness and his grace. And then, and I took some liberty here to keep it going, but we rip up. And what I mean by that is we tear down. We look inside our hearts and we find the things that just plague us at taking the place of God, that drive our focus all the time, and we tear them down. We excise them from the center of our lives. Now, if those are sinful things, we repent of them and we completely remove them. That is what we are called to do, although we won't do it perfectly. We do it increasingly. But if they're good things, they too need to sit on the periphery. And so we should think about where in our free time, where our mind wanders to, what it is that excites us and makes it happy, makes us happy. Those aren't bad things, but if they're not God things, then they're not our primary focus. And so we do that. And after doing all that, we holy up, but this isn't something we do. We do the other things. And see, God promises to make us holy because, again, we cannot earn it on our own. But what God does is he takes people who are sinful and he first declares us holy in Christ. And then through disciplines and actions like this, he walks with us throughout our lives and he actually makes us holy. We are subjects of a holy king. And what are subjects supposed to do? They're supposed to reflect their sovereign's characteristics. They're supposed to reflect the one who reigns and rules and who redeems us. That is the calling on our life. Amen? Let's pray. 
Father God, you are the one who does reign in power. You are the one who rightly and properly rules over the entirety of the universe and who will bring it all on bended knee before you, whether by force or by choice, at the end of history. And Lord, we are so grateful that you have opened our eyes and opened our hearts to who you are and what you have done. I pray, God, if there is somebody who has done that recently, maybe even for the first time today, they have recognized the reality of your holiness, their desperate need for what you have given them in the person of Jesus, uh, that they would rejoice and that they would enter into a life that all of us who call on the name of Christ are supposed to walk in. A life that will be filled with missteps and will be filled with fumblings and even temporary failures, but one that you promise that you will complete in us, that you will see the good work through to the end. And God, we are grateful for that. We ask that you do it all the more in our lives, that you center our thoughts on you, that we would uh, be driven by that to tell others about the big and great things of our God, most particularly your holiness. We thank you for Jesus and all he did for us on the cross and for the gift of the Spirit who indwells us now that we may walk with you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.